Well, thank you very much for, for that introduction, and, um, and thank you also, especially to, to Rajiv, for inviting me here. Um, it's not the first time I've been here. I've been here many times, and I enjoy each one, and which is why I, I keep on coming back. Um, there have been uh, quite a few of these meetings I've attended over the years, and, and looking around at the people uh, that, that have attended this one, it's, it's, uh, I'd, I'd say that Rajiv has outdone himself, and, and this is definitely the best one yet. So. It's great to, to be here to celebrate uh, an anniversary and to, to look at what has happened in the past um, and, uh, and the advances that have been made, which, uh, as you've seen from the various presentations, are truly outstanding. And also to, to try to look to the future, to see what we can do in the future. Because I think 10 years ago, when we were looking at, uh, at what could have been done and what we could all do um, in, in our research, um, we probably wouldn't have been able to predict the changes that have happened in terms of next generation sequencing and how that has impacted biology and, uh, and the advances in breeding technologies that have happened in that time. So it's very difficult to predict the changes that are going to happen over the next 10 years or so. Uh, but I'm going to start uh, speculating in, in, in this presentation about some of, those, uh, some of the things that we, we might be seeing and also uh, having a vision of, of how we generate those changes, how, how we, we move things forward. <clears throat> So, looking at a little bit of history, the um, sequencing technology that, that many of us rely on has, has changed uh, dramatically over the last uh, uh, few decades. Uh, this type of sequencing here, this is, um, uh, this is Sanger sequencing on polyacrylamide gels. This is how I first started doing DNA sequencing. And, and I'm getting old, but I'm not that old. It's, uh, this is not that long ago that people were doing this. Um, things, Sanger sequencing moved on um, uh, pretty well, and, and this is probably the most advanced form of, of Sanger sequencing. I remember when this machine came out, and there's a new machine coming out pretty much every six months or a year, um, and to, to see this one uh, last over the amount of time that it has done, it's still a very efficient machine, is, uh, is quite amazing. If you go back 10 years ago, things really started to change, and, and this is where the revolution happened in, in DNA sequencing and genomics. Um, with the introduction of this machine here, the um, the, the 454 from, from Roche. The, um, it's, it was the first of the next generation sequencers, and, and we were at the cutting edge in Australia. We got the very first one of these within Australia, and we were using it to sequence the Braska genome using a back-by-back -back approach. Um, if you actually look at what we were trying to do then, these are 100 base reads of relatively poor quality, trying to sequence backs to cover a whole genome. It was a, it was a massive effort and, and huge cost as part of a multinational consortium to be able to do this. Um, and it was, uh, it was quickly, um, the, the methods were quickly outdated with the advances in the technologies. So something that, that I've become very aware of is that the technologies uh, catch up. If you've got uh, future thinking ideas, the technologies often catch up and sometimes overtake you. The things, uh, we, we were very happy with this technology when we bought it. Looking back on it, it's, it's really quite archaic. At the time, um, Illumina Selects were producing 30 by, 35 base pair reads. Um, move forward to the current day, um, the Illumina NovaSeq. Um, it's, it's not so much the, the read length or, or the volume, it's, it's the cost, which is really the, the critical issue here. Uh, the cost is uh, 300 uh, gigabases of, of sequence data for less than $2,000, uh, which is just phenomenal. You just you'd be able to, to manage that sort of volume of data, to be able to analyze that. We are now using supercomputers uh, every day to be able to handle and, and, uh, and analyze this sort of data. Uh, so the cost of data generation has come down hugely, um, and it's something that, um, that, that has opened up huge avenues to work with things that, that we couldn't work with before. <clears throat> something which is often not recognized is, is, is you see the, the drop in the cost of, of data, but the quality of data uh, has increased uh, vastly as well. And if you look at the quality of the early Illumina reads compared to uh, the current versions, um, the, the quality has is, is, is increased dramatically. Uh, and that has actually had a major influence on how we analyze the data. Uh, before, if we were mapping data to a reference, for example, and we took the reads that didn't map, the reads that didn't map were, were almost all junk. They were, they were the poor quality reads, and they didn't map because they were poor quality. Now, if we, do, if we do that same exercise, the read qualities are so high that if, if you take the reads that don't map, they're actually things which are real uh, sequence, but they're just not representative of your assembly. And that's, that's, that's a, a, a key improvement, which is uh, often not recognized. <clears throat> 
the generating sequence data and assembling genomes is, um, is, is getting easier and easier, but translating it to improve crops is still a challenge. And we don't have enough examples of this. There are more and more examples of it, uh, particularly using, uh, using targeted markers for, for selection. Uh, this is an example from some of our work. We sequenced the, um, the canola genome, the brassica napis genome, with Bayer Crop Science and BGI back in 2008. Um, and, the, and Bayer used that information, the genome information, to, to identify a, a gene for, for a trait and to characterize that gene in, in canola for, for pod shatter. Uh, now, for those of you who are not familiar, in, in canola, it, 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 you have very small seeds in pods, and one of the, the challenges is that the pods tend to open early and the seed is lost. And this is a natural thing. It's, this is what the wild plants really want to do. They want to spread their seeds, but that's not good for farmers. So farmers have, have to um, uh, cut the, the crop when it's not quite mature, uh, so you're losing yield on that, and then go over a second time to come and harvest it. And even then, there, there are often quite heavy losses, uh, especially if there's severe weather events which, which break open the seeds. The Bayer had identified a, a gene in Arabidopsis associated with pod shatter. Uh, they used the, the genome sequence which we, we developed with them to identify two gene copies. Um, canola is, is an amphidiploid, uh, so the two copies in, in canola. Uh, they looked at gene expression information and they showed that they were just expressed in pod valves. And then they used three different methods to, to modify this. They used two GM type methods and a mutagenesis method where they just screened a, um, uh, a mutagenized um, population. They the, um, the ended up commercializing the mutagenized version, and that, that wasn't to avoid GM issues. It was just what fitted better with the, the breeding program. And this was released last year in Australia and, and the year before in, in the US. In Australia, it's called PodGuard. And with this, it allows the farmers to, to grow the crop to, to full maturity and then directly harvest without significant loss of, loss of seed. Um, so it's environmentally friendly. There are fewer tractor trips. You get approximately a 10% yield benefit over this. And this is one of the first few uh, practical applications that have come from the genome sequences. Um, it would be very difficult to do this without knowing the genome sequence and knowing uh, exactly how many genes were there and where they were. So there are many more of these things going, but things, things move on pretty quickly. I mean, this, this trait was released uh, very recently. But if you actually went and, and started to do this now, you'd actually do it in a very different way. Um, you wouldn't use mutagenized populations and you wouldn't use GM. You'd use CRISPR. Um, and CRISPR is, uh, is something which I believe is going to revolutionize crop breeding. Uh, I think the potential at the moment is, um, is huge. The breeding companies have started to use it. Uh, and, and I think in the future, it will actually change very much the way that we we're producing new crops. And I'll explain that in a little bit of a few more slides. So for those of people who don't know, I don't think many people don't know what CRISPR is, but CRISPR allows gene knockouts. It also allows direct gene editing. Um, and it's an extremely powerful way to generate novel and specific variation. So you can go in there and make specific changes which are not present in the genome. And there's been a lot of discussion over, over wild germplasm and allelic variation, identifying SNPs. You don't have to do that with this. If you know the gene that's important and you can, you can predict the changes that you need to make, um, then you can just go, go ahead and make them. You don't have to look for, for the variation. And that's particularly important for something like pod chatter because the genes for that keep the, the seed in, in the pod, you, you don't really see leading variation for that because that's really selected against in, in populations. So for some traits in particular, it's really important. So Monsanto, uh, I think this was last year, they, they bought a, a license for CRISPR. And I've spoken to most of the major breeding companies now, and most of them either have CRISPR uh, technology just to, to validate genes, uh, but, but quite a few of them also have uh, varieties in the pipeline which are being developed based on, on CRISPR. Uh, and some of these early ones are traits which are already well known, but they're using them to, uh, to get over some regulatory approval. <clears throat> so, how will, how will CRISPR change the, um, the way that people are breeding? Well, we still need a lot of information, but if, if you've got an idea of what, what you can change, you can actually go and make all these changes. And, and rather than making lots and lots of crosses um, and, and selecting the, the essentially cross the best with the best and select for the rest, you can start to go in and, and start to make specific changes within your elite germplasm, which uh, avoids having to, to back cross. And we put uh, did some thought experiments around this, and we started thinking, well, 
if you're developing varieties using CRISPR, um, initially you might start to use sort of some CRISPR modification with some crossing into different varieties. But eventually you're going to get to the point where you have 10, 50, or 100 CRISPR modifications within your genome, um, and it's going to be virtually impossible to then cross those back into to other germplasm. The last thing you want to do with this super elite germplasm is to cross it to something that doesn't have this, this modification. So one of the things that we've, we've been looking at is, is this is likely to change the way that, that breeding happens. So rather than taking the traditional crossing approach, um, where you've got the parental crosses and then various uh, back crosses, field trials, phenotypic selection, and they have this, this cycle which eventually goes out to advanced field trials. Instead of all this crossing, you'd take, <clears throat> you'd edit um, the, the genome of an elite variety, and you'd probably do multiple different edits, and you'd, you'd, you'd modify a, a significant number of genes um, and combinations of. Um, you then do some field trials and phenotypic selection, and then that will take you to your advanced trials. So within this process, you're constantly improving your elite varieties. There's no uh, issue of, of, of reducing the quality by, by crossing them to, to other areas. So for traditional breeding, the approach is you, you identify germplasm with favorable traits. You can use markers and phenotypic selection to, to identify the favorable alleles. Um, you do selections across large breeding families. You have continuous crossing and evaluation cycles. But this is limited by the available diversity and, and the challenge of having to remove the unfavorable alleles. So this is the process at the moment and some of the limitations. For genome editing-based breeding, uh, we still have some major challenges. It's not something that's straightforward at the moment. We need to identify the gene content. And this is, this is key because you need to know what the fundamental uh, material is you're going to be editing. You need to be able to predict the uh, impact of modifying the sequence of genes. And this is probably one of the biggest challenges of, of, at all, of, of everything. And this is where a lot of the information for that, that needs to be gathered from, from current processes. We still need wild germplasm. We still need uh, evaluations of phenotypic variation. We still need lots of genome sequencing and, um, and, and, uh, and genotyping because we need to know which genes are important. We need to know which allelic variants are out there and, and actually have some value. Um, they can be brought in through genome uh, editing, plus novel variants can be brought in by genome editing, but knowing what to edit is crucial at the beginning. So this would include continuous editing and evaluation cycles, so you're continually improving your germplasm. And the limitations, at, at the moment, the, the, the process of genome editing is still relatively not as, not as quick uh, or as cost-effective as it could be. I think this is something which is going to improve very, very quickly. Um, I, th I think there's a huge amount of effort. And even now, some of the techniques that are coming in are, uh, are really quite advanced. Um, and the lack of knowledge of targets is really what is, is limiting it at the moment. So if you want to look to see what we need to edit, we need to have a reference genome sequence. And there's been lots of discussion and presentations on reference genome sequences. And we've been assembling genomes for, for a number of years now. And one of the things that, that we, we, we discovered was, was that having one reference genome isn't really enough because we're seeing a lot of presence-absence variation uh, between the genomes. So we've started doing, doing pan-genome analysis. So a pan-genome is, is not a sequence of an individual, but a representative sequence which should cover all the genes of, of a species. So we've shown that a reference genome, and hopefully I'll show this in a few slides, a reference genome does not represent the diversity of a species. We have a lot of presence-absence variation of genes, and these are responsible for important traits, and I'll hopefully present that to you shortly. And we need to know the gene content for genome editing. So the previous model is that phenotypic variation was due to small changes or SNPs in the, in the sequence, and the current model is that SNPs are still important, they, 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 are, they are very important, but also gene presence-absence variations, particularly for some traits, is also crucial. There are three main methods of, of producing a pangenome. The De Bruyne graph approach has been used uh, extensively for bacteria. Uh, it doesn't really work for, for large and complex organisms at the moment, and I, I still think with, uh, it's going to take quite a lot of algorithm development for, for that to, to be applied in plants. The, uh, the, probably the most common and straightforward one to think of is the de novo assembly approach, where you just sequence multiple individuals and, and assemble them and, uh, and compare them. Um, and then there's the iterative assembly approach, which is one that we use quite extensively. So for de novo assembly, you generate high coverage sequence data for each individual. You assemble, you annotate, and then you compare the gene content. And we published a paper earlier this year in PBJ 
uh, which highlighted some of the issues with this. We sequence and assemble two canola genomes. We use exactly the same annotation uh, pipelines. And then we showed that the vast majority of things that looked like presence absence variation were actually due to differences in the annotation and differences in the assembly. The very similar genomes can have quite different annotations, and the differences in assembly and annotation may mask the real differences. There is a big advantage of taking this approach is that you know exactly where those presence absence variations are in the genome, which the iterative of assembly method you don't have. For the iterative assembly, it's, it's a lot cheaper for a start. You need a relatively small amount of sequence data. We used to have a minimum of 10x coverage. Um, we start with a reference, and it could be any, we usually take the best reference available. You map the reads to the reference, and then you assemble the reads which don't map, and then add these new contexts to the assembly. And you can keep on repeating this as you get more and more data coming through for different individuals, either as pools or as single plants, depending on the amount of coverage that you have. You then place these contigs where you can on the genome using paired end or mate pair data. If you've got a single reference, we can usually place about 40% of these genes with, with a reasonably high confidence. If you've got multiple references, you can obviously get more. Um, and then the important thing, for each of these varieties, you can perform presence absence assessments on the reference. So having a pan genome is one thing, but what's, what you actually need to know is which genes are present or absent in the line that you're interested in. And, and this, this gives you this information. So the presence absence uh, analysis is, is like this. It's, this is a quick cartoon. Um, you've just got no coverage over gene one compared to gene two. Um, in reality, it looks a little bit more like this, where these are the genes that are lost. Uh, these are genes which have, seem to have undergone some sort of um, modification, uh, and these are the, most of the genes that are highly conserved. So the first example that we published was, was Brassica oleracea, and here we took multiple different uh, morphotypes of, of Brassica. Um, cabbages, cauliflowers, broccolis, um, and this is published in, in Nature Communications. We had a couple of reference genomes to, to start with. Uh, we used the TO1000 as the base reference, and the pan genome had a significant increase in the number of genes um, and also in, in total genome size compared to the references. And we showed that almost 20% of the genes here were variable, so they were present in some individuals but not other ones. When you model this and actually start to look at the um, the size, you can start to predict um, how big the, the, the genome, the gene content is for this species. And using this modeling, we showed that with just nine individuals, we'd actually assembled almost all of the genes for this species. Uh, so we've got a predicted pan genome size, the core genome size starts to, to level off. So we start to get an idea of the gene content for a species based, based on a relatively few individuals. What we were expecting to see but didn't uh, was that they were, were expecting to see that the uh, certain presence absence variation would be associated with morphotype. And, uh, and we've shown that that was not the case. There's no real strong evidence for that. Uh, and that's quite useful for breeding these vegetables because if you're looking for variation in cabbage, you don't actually have to go to cauliflowers or Brussels sprouts or whatever to bring in the variation. Just look for different cabbages. A lot of the gene content will be there. Are the variable genes important? Well, if, if plants can cope without them, they're obviously not essential. But when you look at the, uh, the gene ontology analysis, um, and this is very similar to most pan-genome studies, uh, defense response really stands out. It's really quite important. We followed a similar study in Brassica napus. The pan-genome is significantly larger. Um, we had 40% of the variable genes. So what you might expect, because it's an amphidiploid, it's got two genome copies in there. When we looked at the cause of the, the gene loss here, uh, we were quite surprised because a lot of the lost genes uh, seem to be co-located. And this is especially so in the synthetic varieties. So these are varieties that have been brought together uh, as opposed to the natural um, Brassica napus. Uh, and what this has caused, and, and I think Scott discussed this a little bit with PMERS, is, is that when you get a novel um, species coming together from, from um, from novel polyploids, you do get uh, non-reciprocal translocation of, of uh, uh, chromosomes and associated gene loss from the, uh, in this case, the, uh, the, the C genome. In this case, it was directional. Most of the things went from, 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 C to, from A to C. Um, and again here, if you're looking at it, it's mostly defense response type genes that are, that are important. We've done quite a few different species. I'm not going to name them all, but this is, wheat is the last one, I think, that we're going to talk about. Wheat, 17,000 million bases, absolutely horrible to work with. Um, we sequenced, uh, we made a pan genome of 18 elite varieties. We, we'd sequenced 16, I think there was two publicly available. Uh, we had 350 million bases in addition to Chinese spring. Um, 
And what we found was that there were 245 genes in Chinese spring which are absent from the 18 cultivars, but there were 12,150 genes which were identified in all of the 18 cultivars, but not in Chinese spring. So if you want to use a wheat genome reference, don't use Chinese spring. Go and use one of Mike's references or one of Curtis's references, which are probably more related to what's actually happening in wheat. Or use the pan genome. This, this is, again, published, so this is, this is all available. Again, we model the pan genome size, and we looked at presence-absence variation. This is just a dendrogram based on presence-absence variation, which shows that Chinese spring is really quite significantly different. So we can produce pan genomes. We can capture the genome variation that's in there. We know that there's quite a significant um, uh, decrease uh, in, in, uh, in benefit as you start to sequence uh, even more lines. You start to capture pretty much all the gene content, and you start to capture all the allelic variation. And this is one of the reasons why you need CRISPR. But once you've got all this information together, you need to be able to, to capture it, to be able to, to interrogate it. And there are quite a few databases which have been brought together which, which assist breeders. So there's, um, there's the, the germinate system that um, Dave is, is somewhere about, is, is, has been developing. This is a Trinity toolbox out of the US, which seems to work very well for some cereals. Um, some of these databases have some limitations in being tabular. <clears throat> and unfortunately, biological data, it, it doesn't fit that well within tabular databases. So, We've been working with Rothamsted Research on, um, on graph databases, and we've been extending these. And, and graph databases seem to hold biological data a lot better. And within this, you've got pieces of information, which are, which are nodes in the graph. Uh, and these pieces of information, it could be a bibliographic reference where something is mentioned. It could be a particular line. It could be a SNP variation. It could be a trait. It could, could, be, could be any of these pieces of information, gene expression. We have quantitative edges between them, so you can actually store quantitative meanings with, between things. You can have as many edges between nodes as, as you like. So it's not always a one-to-one -one relationship as you, as you often have with tabular databases. You can get really complex graphs of, of, of data networks. This really reflects better, I think, the, 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 the diversity of biological information and how it's interconnected. Um, it's still very early days with these databases, but I see these uh, extending hugely. And I think the, um, the, the potential to be able to develop master databases of these, to be able to interrogate uh, across broad uh, themes, I think is going to be essential for, for identifying CRISPR targets. We want to pull as much information as possible, both from within the species that you're working with and also comparative species. Another challenge of this is you've got to be able to interrogate the data. And, and we're developing new ways to be able to traverse these sort of graphs to be able to pull out meaningful information. Again, it's very early days, but I think these things are going to be key for the implementation of, of CRISPR crops. So just to review the potential of CRISPR crop production, we think it can accelerate crop production. We think we can reduce the cycle time. And from talking to breeding companies, we think the cycle time for production is, is, is going to be significantly decreased compared to traditional breeding, and especially compared to GM-type breeding. Um, we could domesticate new crops, uh, and there's certainly a need for this. If you wanted a crop that, that grows and is adapted to a particular climate, you can either take a known crop and then take it to, to that environment and try to, to adapt it. Um, or you can actually take a plant that's already growing there and make it more like a crop. And because we know so much about how crops work and, and the, the features of what makes a crop and domestication, it, the, the second is probably easier. We can rapidly adapt to leaf varieties to new and changing environments, and particularly in the face of climate change, this is going to be key. Um, we can add novel diversity and traits which are unavailable in wild or domestic species. And I think the pod chatter is one example of that. Um, and I think this opens up huge, huge potential to be able to do things that have not even been conceived before. And potentially, and I say potentially, they're more acceptable than transgenic crops. I think this is one of the biggest challenge that, challenges that we're going to face. The limitations, identification of targets, as I said, what's the starting material, what do we edit? Improve target specificity and efficiency, and then again, socio-political acceptance. So if anyone has any influence on, 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 on social people to be able to, to, to change the way that people think, then go out and do this. I think we should all be standing up and, uh, and facing the media and, and saying how this is essential if we're going to be able to feed the growing population. And with that, and with 30 seconds spare, I need to thank the various people who have um, paid me to, uh, and, and provided support, whether it's computational support or, or cash dollars or, um, or just space. Um, 
this is my team who've, who've contributed to all this. Uh, they're all computational people, and they're, they're, they're all astounding. Uh, some of them have moved on. Juan's just completed his PhD. Uh, Pradeep uh, was co-supervised with, uh, with Rajiv. He's, he's now working um, with Mario in, 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 uh, in the UK. Um, and these are various collaboration people who've worked with me on the, the wheat work that I presented and the brassica work as well. Especially thanks to, to Jackie, who is um, not only uh, an astounding support, but also the wife and mother of my children. Uh, and with that, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much. Okay, we are very glad to note that Amir Khan is also a member of the... <laughs> Yes, yes. Sorry, yeah, yeah. Currently jointly supervised. Where is he? <laughs> yeah. Questions. How many how many genes can you tackle with one approach with CRISPR? Any ideas? Are there upper restrictions? I mean how many genes you can target? Yeah. Was one attempt or? Um, there's there's a, a couple of answers to that. One of them is, is that we don't really know. It depends on the technology. But currently, um, if you want to uh, look at multiple orthologs, you can, you can use one construct to, to modify multiple orthologs at the same time, which is particularly useful for things like wheat. And there, I think there are constructs that will allow you to, to modify uh, several genes at the same time. Um, and I think this is only going to change. The, the technology is still very new. Um, and I think it's, it's really going to be a question of how many genes you would want to modify. Um, if you want to convert um, a, a particular line into, into one of your elites and you already know what to edit because you've edited it before, then you probably want to, to do it as high throughput fashion as possible. But most of the time, you probably only want to modify one, two, or a few combinations of genes that are of interest and then put them in the field and see what they look like. So but I think for, for a lot of routine selection, you probably don't want to do too many. But, but you're right, for, for if you're going to take uh, one line and, and bring it to your elite status using maybe 100 uh, modifications that are known, then that would be, uh, it would be a bigger job and be, you'd need bigger technology. Well, you, you gave a wonderful talk, and, and I mean about wonderful work. Um, what I found surprising is that you focused a lot on, let's say, the gene space. Yeah. Uh, I found your example very impressive about the you know, Chinese and the other variety where you say, wow, there was a big difference in uh, you know, the number of genes or the gene sets. But what about all the non-coding you know, space of the genome? This is much, much larger. What about, for example, long non-coding RNAs, short you know, non-coding RNAs. What about all that stuff? Did you take it into account? And I'm asking specifically yeah. also about this, um, you know, the database that you, uh, or the data portal uh, that you presented. Um, is that part of it? Would it be easy to, to look, for example, at, at these things uh, pertaining to non-coding um, yeah. RNA? Yeah, for, so, so there's lots of non-coding stuff in the genome, um, and the vast majority of it is junk. And frankly, I find boring. Um, so I'm not interested in that. But there is, you're right, there's, there's a huge amount of stuff which is functional. So anything which is functional, whether it's a microRNA, that again would be incorporated in the database. Um, one of the things that we've been looking at um, is, is identifying novel CRISPR targets. So for example, a gene might be, might be well known to, to play a functional role, um, and, and that would be, be quite valuable to go in there and modify that gene. But often there are patterns around that which prevent you to, from, from going in there and using that in any shape or form without getting permission or, or paying a license. However, we know that there are lots of regulators of that gene which haven't been fully characterized. So one of the things we're doing is to go through and identify regulators of genes, whether it's, it's non-coding RNA or, or other regulators, which will allow you to modify that gene and therefore have an expected phenotype, but get around that pattern. Um, so, so we're actually looking at other alternatives which, which, which could be useful for that. We think commercially it could, could be quite useful. And also, if you're, if you're working in crops where you don't want to have to pay multinational companies uh, for licenses, then again, it's going to be quite useful. Excellent. And, and what about non-coding or regulatory SNPs, for example? Are they also be present and can they be searched for? Um, I did. Any, anything that's functional should be put into the database. Uh, it, it's, the database isn't specific. It doesn't go through and, and capture very specific things. What it does, it'll, it'll go and capture all the bibliographic, bibliographic information. So if you publish uh, an non-coding uh, SNP that has a function, 
then it will be linked in the database and you'll be able to go through to that. It'll be linked to the sequence of that. So, yeah. Maybe last question from my end. What about epigenomics data? <laughs> well, I mean, that, yeah. that should be uh, quite important as well, right? It, it, it should be, and we are doing some epigenomic work. It's, um, and yeah, that's, that's, that's a whole different field. Um, capturing that information is, is a challenge. Uh, generating the, the epigenomic profile is, is, is obviously a challenge. Again, the, the CRISPR type mechanism will allow you to, to potentially go and do that. Um, how heritable that is, again, is questionable, but there's certain commercial aspects to that. Um, cer certainly, there's, there's a huge amount of potential there. Um, although most of the epigenetic modification, the epigenetic regulation, has got a genetic basis. So you don't necessarily always have to go and, and, and control the, the epigenetic modification in an epigenetic way. You can do it in a genetic way. All right. Thank you very much again. And please join me in thanking our speaker.